welcome back to Property Matters on Dublin South FM with myself, Carol Tallon. You can contact us on Twitter at iProperty Radio or email hello at iPropertyRadio.com. I'm now joined by Vince Harney, Chartered Surveyor, Chartered Accountant and Chartered Tax, uh, tax Advisor. So Vince is CEO of Anna Soren and, with, and has more than 25 years experience in senior finance uh, director roles with development companies uh, worldwide. So Vince, you're very welcome back to the show. We've relied on your expertise before, so we're delighted to have you back. Thank you, Carol. Delighted to be back. Um, Vince, we spoke to you at the start of the year. An awful lot of change, an awful lot has changed since the start of the year. Just before the summer break, there was a run of housing legislation uh, culminating in uh, the housing for all strategy that was announced um, earlier this month. So this is so I, I definitely want to speak to you about many um, aspects of that. But tomorrow, Wednesday, um, you're running a seminar for the uh, Chartered Surveyor Society of Ireland, the SESI, um, about build to rent. You might just give us an overview of what that seminar is going to take in. Yes, that's right. Um, well, basically, it's it's capturing uh, everything for people from people who don't know what BTR is about, what it even means, because everybody keeps using BTR, which means build to rent. Um, but really to talk about the sector and how it's gaining momentum, popularity, and becoming a mainstream asset class, I would say. So these are the key points we're focusing on. And a, a couple of things talking about what schemes are happening now, who's doing the deals, what type of deals they are. And, and also importantly, Carol, as you suggested before with all the legislation, how this fits into the context of the housing for all. Um, announcement that's just been made in the last couple of weeks. Okay, and, and that's something actually I wanted to address with you today, but let's roll back a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Build to Rent, you're absolutely right. The acronym is being used almost interchangeably with uh, the private rented sector, and they're, that's they're right. very different. Um, yeah. So, you know, th there, there's definitely an issue with language, but there's also an issue with... Um, uh, unhelpful monikers or terms of... of um, you know, in terms being used in the media that are not helpful as well. And, and that's caused such confusion and not just across consumers, across the industry as well, I've noticed. I, th I think that's right. I mean, I think it's been highlighted recently. I mean, you, you've probably read the articles in The Independent and The Times where um, you see Sh Sinn Féin object to a BTR scheme on principle rather than understanding what it's about, and what it's delivering, what it's meant to be doing. Um, and uh, which, which clouds the issue because it, it, it doesn't understand what the purpose, et cetera. And, and like you said, the anacronym sometimes isn't helpful. They equate BTR equals vulture fund equals somebody screwing somebody else. And that's not the case. Yeah. But, uh, uh, on the other side of it, um, objections are certainly not restricted to any one political party. What we've seen that's is true. that this is so, absolutely a cross party issue and it's a cross absolutely. societal issue. Um, so actually, right. yeah, so in terms of um, built to rent, it's well established outside of Ireland, but it's sure. to say it is a, a fairly new asset class in Ireland. It's a new asset class in Ireland, as it was in the UK a few years ago, because it emanated from the USA, where it's, a, it's known as multifamily. And um, it's, in the USA, it's popular because it gives people the ability to move from town to town fairly quickly, go wherever the work is, um, giving them the lifestyle that they want as well. And in the UK, the take up was, it was probably negligible at 2010, but now it's fast becoming the mainstream asset class. Every town centre has probably been rejuvenated by it. And I think the impact has happened in Dublin since about 2017, 2018. A lot of transactions 2019, 2020, coming out of the COVID pandemic. And now you, you've just got to look around. Predominantly, I admit, Dublin based, but equally, um, the major cities in Ireland can benefit from the rejuvenation of the city centres into urban lifestyle living. Yeah, th that's a really interesting one because actually, um, to, to see the experience of this rollout in the UK. We, we, we can't even, um, we've nothing to compare that to in Ireland because built to rent, uh, we're barely looking at the early schemes in mm -hmm. Cork. To my knowledge, I don't know 
um, if there are any in, in Galway or Limerick um, due to viability issues. So at the moment, really, all we have to base this on in is Dublin. But do you yeah. see in the long term as this asset class grows that we're likely to see this in market towns up and down the country? Very possibly. Um, very possibly. I mean, you've got you've got the usual problems you have um, with people living away from town centres. It's all about delivering lifestyle as well, Carol, where you've got a, a focal point that brings people together uh, and having people live in sort of in, a, in that close environment is beneficial. You've got the schools, the restaurants, the areas, that whole lifestyle and, and importantly, <laughs> sense of community, you know, and, and rejuvenating the city centres of some of the towns is, is ideal for that. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of stuff. You've you've only got to go to some of the city centres to see there's some existing um, spaces that would lend itself ideally to those multi-family stroke BTR assets. Yeah, it's interesting actually that that's something that gets lost in the conversation around rent, rent to build in Ireland. Whereas actually, if you look at uh, uh, or sorry, built to rent, uh, if you look at that, the amenity is one of the the differentiating factors. You know, you touched yes. on it there, not just about the um, the quality of the offering, which rental in Ireland has not always been known for. Um, it is that fostering a sense of community. Um, so Correct. in terms of built to rent, if we look at the amenity, what what are the real differentiators here between maybe what um, Irish renters would have been used to in the Irish market? I, I would say the differentiators are your uh, the first one is you're creating a community, right? So the, the first point is that they're, they're not soulless concrete blocks in the middle of nowhere that people don't speak to each other. Um, often they will have a, a lot of green areas, green space. I mean, it's quite interesting, even some of the ones in London, they've created the green space on top of the roofs <laughs> or in certain areas, so uh, slightly different. Um, but they will have things like on-site amenities such as um, restaurants, retail, um, places for people to meet and socialise, which is quite an important facet. Um, and, and also they'll be close to uh, local transport hubs and um, maybe even close to places of work. So pe people can get that separation but be in a close proximity to where they need to be. Yeah, one of the main criticisms, uh, particularly in Ireland, has been around the uh, the levels of rent charge. So, as in, this is a this yeah. is quite a premium offering. Is there? Yeah. You know, you're more familiar with, um, say, the service across the UK. Across the UK, now that uh, built rent is more established, are we seeing? Um, is there is there a, a scale, a sliding scale, where you've got premium providers, but you've more affordable <laughs> options as well, or is it all premium? I think that's true. Actually, strangely enough, probably in the UK, it's more location dependent. So um, you'll, you'll pay real premium dollar for schemes in London as opposed to, say, Manchester. Well, there's still a premium to be paid because what you're paying for is the lifestyle, I think. So does, you, know, you know that it's like buying properties as well. You can buy... Um, a, 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 a normal house for X, but a premium house will cost you more. So there is that level to it. However, there is an equal, equilibrium in the market where the, uh, the rents are fairly, um, I wouldn't say static, but at least come down to a, a, an equalised uh, level now. So they're not sky high by any means. I think one of the benchmarks as well, also, Carol, which is quite interesting, is that they uh, they and this is internationally, they will always be higher than anybody's mortgage. Okay, it just, just has to make that quite clear because th there is um, an inference from certain people that, you know, buying a house is always cheaper and, and undoubtedly is if you've got the capital to put down in the first place. So... Is this, is this a difference between um, the Irish renting mentality and maybe other jurisdictions because you know yeah. we haven't had a very diverse rental market in Ireland and in fact only in recent days I was speaking to the developer of a new scheme and they they described what they're looking to deliver as more of um, a, as they refer to it a European model whereby yeah. actually um, they're looking at longer term leases yeah. so not, not two years they're looking at five years but they're also looking at 
the people who are acquiring or going in to, um, to take up these leases, they actually will be responsible for fully furnishing them. They may even yeah. have input into some of the finishes, which is very unusual. Yeah. I've never heard of that in a rental situation in Ireland. Also, I mean, are Irish tenants ready to um, invest in fully furnishing a brand new home, invest in putting in uh, the white goods um, mm. and things like that on a rental property? We've, we've no uh, experience of that in Ireland. That's true, it's, it's, it's new. Uh, and, and actually that does emanate, that is very much European attitude. You, you, you look in, it's quite interesting, I haven't got, got it with me, but there's a statistic that shows, say, Germany is, I would say, the, one of the highest rent, rental areas ever. But they all sign up for incredibly long leases. Um, I mean, I, I know in Dresden, for example, a lot of people will invest in a 20-year lease right which is phenomenal you know instead of buying it because they like the fact that um the stuff's provided for them the services are there for them and they don't mind paying for those services rather than having the the ownership but to, that, that medium you're talking about maybe of the five year with the the white goods and thing it's a mindset issue i think that a, a lot of it a lot of the young um people nowadays buy into that there's it's not the same as maybe people of my generation where it's very much ownership led rather than anything else. Um, and you've got to own assets and you, this, that and the other. I, I think people are a little bit more circumspect nowadays. Yeah, by, I mean, uh, the only thing is I remember, you know, maybe a decade ago when we looked into different home ownership levels um, mm -hmm. and, you know, Germany was one country that came up as, um, you know, being very low home ownership rates. However, right. um, they would have had um, people getting involved in more diverse investments um, at a much yeah. earlier stage. So you have sure. people in their 20s investing in stocks and shares and other asset classes. Yeah. So they were never dependent. In Ireland, we've had this mentality that you pay into your mortgage and that essentially is your retirement. Um, and that's something where we can see that there's definitely going to be an issue with long-term rental because these changes have happened before the people were prepared for them. So they're not financially prepared. So people who are still renting yeah. in their forties and fifties are not financially prepared what's going to happen when they stop create or when they stop generating an income. That, that That's right, Carol. I think you've hit the nail on the head there, but I, I don't, th I think that's a transitionary type um, um, how do I say arrangement because certainly the demographics if you look how people have shifted I mean um, home ownership I would say was probably fairly common in the 20s and um, you know say 10-15 years ago now that's been pushed out to 35 because people cannot afford mm. the capital input so there's that side as well and I echo what you're saying but you've still got this um, attitude that the investment in real estate is more important than the investment in equities, stocks, and any diversified portfolio, because people predominantly regard those as being quite risky. Um, equities are quite high risk. Um, they can be brilliant one minute and bomb the next. So uh, there's a stability to own, owning your own home. And, and people actually, I would say, are looking to have second homes or that's the sort of real estate investments they're looking at. Well, notwithstanding that we're at an early stage of built rent in Ireland, what role do you see this particular sector playing in the overall housing market going forward? I, I think it's an intrinsic and massively important uh, aspect. I was just looking at that housing for all brochure this morning, actually, and the commitment to get to 300 houses by 2030, which I think is quite a tall commitment, by the way. Um, 170,000 of those are private-led uh, units. And I think the um, at least 50% of those will be uh, built to rent provided, which probably just goes to show you just how much is required of the built to rent sector. Okay, um, that's an interesting one because I was just looking and the most up-to-date figures I could see for the UK was that a uh, built rent, is it hovering somewhere between 8 and 12% of the overall housing delivery? Yeah, yeah, 
It is, it is. And I, th I was looking at statistics there. God, this is sad, isn't it? I was looking at statistics there. It was around the 200,000 units mark that they've, they've, they've done to date. Um, so that's, that's quite impressive statistic if you see where it's come from. And that's in a, a relatively short period of time. Okay, um, okay. And Vince, you mentioned the housing for all, and you know you're absolutely right. I think it's the figure three hundred and twelve thousand by twenty thirty. You know, I yes. have spoken to anybody, public or private sector, who has any concept of how delivery is going to be ramped up like that. Obviously, it's one of those things that we hope they're right, but it's very difficult to see a pathway to achieving that, particularly at the moment. Um, but you know, housing for all. Um, there's a lot in that. I, I think 213 action points, and I always believe yeah. if you're really serious about something. I, I think I would have had more confidence in it if they came forward with three actions. That could really, yeah, I, I think 213. That scares me. There's and there's a lot of profet. You're, you're absolutely right. There's massive uh, um, pressure to deliver on everything, uh, and uh, when you spread in the the amount like that, it, it's it, something is bound to fail because there's a lot of things that need to happen in the first place before that can even be tackled properly. So, I mean, one of the big things is the private and public partnerships um, need to be firmly established so that things can just be moved on at a fast pace. Um, and one of my worries as well is, Carol, is, is about delivery. We're now in September 21, and we're talking about doing 300 by December 30. I think we've lost another year in a way because <laughs> things are not going to move out particularly fast so we're talking over nine years so particularly when we see that planning uh yeah and the, are down and planning commencements are down yeah and 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 this is it as well um one of the things that it was talking about was our role of or of um we, how do we say it changing the um attitude to planning uh and moving that forward that is going to take some time, Carol. Um, it's not a quick fix tomorrow morning job. And it means that uh, the planning process is going to be have to adhere to, I would think, for the next two to three years before we get to any um, smooth uh, established process to speed things up. Yeah, so, planning, planning is such, a, you know, it almost seems like... Um, the beast that nobody can manage you know everybody knows it needs to be tackled and to be fair during covid some advancements have been made kind of mm -hmm. towards digitizing which has been on the agenda for quite some yeah. time um but you know we're referring to housing for all but actually before that and before the summer recess um there were uh, i think seven bills pushed forward in the last couple of weeks of the doll sitting and about five of those related to uh, construction property housing um thereabouts including um you know the the phasing out of the strategic uh, developments how yeah. do you think that's going to impact on built rent is it going to be positive or negative uh, I, I personally i i think it's going to have to be positive it it initially you would think it would be negative because they're getting rid of a very structured type of zoning but Equally, we've got to move forward with the new type of zonings that they're producing. Um, and they've got to promote what they want to promote, which is housing. Um, so I, I think it could be neutral in some ways. Um, the, the, the process just needs to be shifted on. Um, I think it is difficult, uh, Carol, to comment with any great detail until we start some of the tangibility of what they're suggesting. Yeah. Um, it, well, we, you know, one of the big things around um, the strategic housing developments when we speak to developers who are actually trying to push these through is that, you know, in theory, if the, if the timelines were honoured, then then that would be one thing. But actually, it's the um, the delays and the impact of judicial reviews, you know, yep. even those judicial reviews, um, you know, even if they go through and, and the development can proceed um, so th they're not completely derailed by the judicial review they're at least uh they're at least delayed but more importantly now because we know in the first six months of this year 48 percent of all um all uh, housing applications were subject to um they were subject to a judicial review so actually 48 yeah. percent in the first six months of this year what developers are, are now doing is they're not taking action 
for a period of two months so they can wait and see are they likely to be um, subject to a judicial review so yeah. in one way it's a self-imposed delay but it's also a very reasonable um approach to I, I think two months is absolutely reasonable carol but you know I, I i think they're absolutely right to do it as well um and to be honest with you the the government needs to actually um follow through with their proposals with action to do, deal with this backlog already because it's creating um a new sound its own neck if it's not careful yeah but once we're accepting those levels of delays then the shd process isn't working as it, it's well, yeah that's that's right if, if it's going back into the local authorities which of course it is you know there are improvements that can be made to to um to streamline that and and we hope that all parties will be on board with that but we're st we still have the community element that, um where people need to have more of a say in the development yeah. so that they're not derailing them for reasonably small or relatively small issues um in fact the telegraph in the uk yesterday just published um an exploratory piece talking about nimbyism and how to tackle it and one of the one of the proposals there is that um people within a community, residents within a community, whether they're renting or they own their own home, will be given an opportunity to vote on new developments coming in. And when I first read it, I was thinking, well, that's terrible, they're all going to vote no. But actually, as I thought about it, this could be really, this could be really strong and really powerful because what we've seen through the judicial reviews is that it's always the, the loud minority um, that are shouting. It's a handful of people derailing projects. The majority of people even if they're comfortable in their own home, their family aren't, their adult kids yeah. aren't, their grandkids aren't, and there's no prospect for them um, to be. So, you know, are we, have we done the community or the public a disservice by not trusting them with more information so that they can get on board with these types of developments? So, you know, for example, Bill to Rent, you talk there about um, the importance of community. It's one of the key amenities, everything through built to rent is being done to foster this sense of community. But it's not just within the tenants moving into that building. It's yeah. because they're moving in as long term tenants. So, you yeah, know, so we'll the leases longer. Yeah. they yeah. will have more of a role in their local community. Correct. Absolutely. Is that being done well in other places? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, my my hometown of Manchester, that you should see it, Hon honestly. I remember growing up there and there was in the city centre there was no sense of community. Really? Now it's seriously, yeah. It was it was a go to work, come out. Now it's people are living in there and and, and it, it does really have that sense of vibrancy and community in there. And other places, Leeds, London, they've all got that. You know, London's got villages now inside the city centre. It's might sound stupid, but it does. There's local communities in there and, and they're very defined and I, I think that's what people like more than anything else is that sense of community and belonging. Do you think the longer term leases will pr help promote this? So for example people yes. uh, people who are <laughs> living in their own communities whether it's um, in towns, villages, cities, if they see a bill to rent development coming in but they know the leases are longer than two years, possibly three years, four years, mm -hmm. five years, do you think that will change the perception and they will see that actually these are people who are going to come in, start families, have their children attend the local schools, they're going to frequent the local businesses? I, I agree, Carol, absolutely. It, it's all about stability uh, on both sides, actually. It's stability for the tenant, for the community and for the investor as well, isn't it? So it, it works well all ways around, I think. And you're absolutely right. That, that, that sense of community, if, you, if you're living in it and part of it, um, uh, with a with that um, long term commitment is absolutely the way forward. And um, Vince, at the start of the interview, we mentioned there that you're going to be hosting um, a seminar for the SCSI tomorrow morning, Wednesday at um, eleven a.m. Do you know? Is, are you going to be speaking to an industry audience? It's a mixture, actually, Carol. I do know that um, there are all the usual players in there. There's there's people from Greystar, Heinz. Hope McDonald, the um, PRS agent, as I call them, um, and m many other there. But there's equally, there's a lot of people that are just signed up out of interest to know a little bit more about PTR. 
Okay, and, and obviously that's a positive thing because yes, we want to educate the industry, but actually there needs to be a wider education. I don't suppose there's any journalists signed up for that. We could do with that. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure Paul McNeve will be there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he crosses, but you know he, he straddles both sides um no but look yeah. in all seriousness this is a really important thing that we need to get the messaging right um but also we need to get the delivery right but the reality is the community can't be left behind because they're and, they're the people who have derailed it in the past and i, I don't say that in a, in a blaming way i say yeah. it actually i think like all communications it, the duty was on the developer to communicate how their development and the people who were going to live in it was going to enhance the community and if they failed to do that you know that was leading to judicial review so I, I don't when I when I talk about the community like that I'm certainly not blaming them I think there's an education process that needs to happen and a lot of that has to come from the developer however um the, it can't you know we can't have this them or us uh, polarizing all the different solution providers in the marketplace which is happening at the moment one of the positive things about housing for all i hope is that it shows that we need all the solution providers um and there's a there's a place for each of them we don't need to be pitting one against the other yes i, I agree absolutely carol i mean what, one of the things that i find a bit disturbing is that people think btr is the old concrete jungle and um it's it's not it's certainly not uh, it's part of the solution. I don't think it's the solution. It's part of the solution to improve housing for everybody and, and to create that sense of community, I think. Yeah. Look, so, it, it will be interesting to see. Obviously, we want to get built to rent um, growing in Ireland, but, but on the right track in a way that it genuinely is a solution provider and it, yeah. it's integrating community as well um, because it's something that we failed at in the past across all placemaking, whether it's public or private housing. Um, so, but the only thing is there's an opportunity now to get this right, but it will require people rowing together and that includes uh, public, private, rental and ownership. You know, what, what's the main takeaway that you want people on the seminar tomorrow to, to, to leave with? I, I want them to leave with the fact that this, this is a mainstream asset class and that it, what it is is part of the overall solution for the housing crisis that we're under. And to understand that it, far from being an antagonistic approach is, is to create a sense of community that used to reside with inside urban centres uh, and um, to recreate that. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. That was Vince Harney, CEO of Anna Soren. We'll be back after a quick break.